Good morning, good evening, and welcome back to another CIQ webcast. We appreciate you joining us. Uh, if you would like and subscribe, make sure we can stay in touch with you. Today, we're going to be talking about Werewolf. I know we talked about this a few weeks back, but we're going to do a, a little bit of a deeper dive. And today, I have Greg and Michael here with me. Hi, Zane. Yeah. How are you? Good. Hey, Hi, me. Michael. Hey, Michael. Hey, Greg. Nice to see you all. It's been a while. You, you've been on with us before, right, Michael? No, this is my first time. So introduce yourself. Okay, my name is Michael uh, Young. Um, I work here at CIQ as a Linux support engineer. And um, since starting to work here, uh, I was tasked with learning Werewolf, and so got to know it um, pretty well. And actually, you uh, have been able to use it with uh, several uh, customers. So um, I'm glad to be here and see what I can do to help offer. Uh, more help on uh, the understanding of how great a tool Werewolf is. Excellent. Thank you very much. I would like, if you don't mind, Greg, to kind of start off, just give us an overview again of what Werewolf is to make sure that everybody everybody understands. Sure, I'd be happy to. So um, when, when I talk about what it is, I always like to kind of go back in history and tell a little story. Uh, so Werewolf started back in 2001. Um, I was tasked with uh, running a bunch of Linux clusters um, at Berkeley Lab in the Department of Energy. And um, I was already pretty much completely tasked. I, sorry. <laughs> this is live. Coming over the shoulder. Um, yeah, everybody's okay. Uh, <laughs> I was tasked with running a bunch of uh, uh, clusters or a few clusters for a few different groups within uh, Berkeley Lab. And I was already completely overwhelmed with regards to work, as you everybody can imagine. Uh, so, when somebody, you know, when they proposed to me that I need to be being, maintaining, you know, clusters of hundreds of nodes, uh, I wanted to figure out if there was a better way of managing those nodes. Now, at that point, there was a few uh, cluster toolkits that existed. Um, uh, Rocks is one, not related to Rocky, but Rocks, Rocks clusters is one. Uh, Oscar was was the no another one that was um, highly highly utilized. Uh, Donald Becker was working on one called Skilled um, at the time, uh, but I, I felt as though we needed to, we needed to approach this kind of differently, and I really wanted to focus on the idea of stateless. And so, what Werewolf is is a way of uh, administrating the operating system of lots of compute resources in an extraordinarily scalable and configurable way, and that's what we've been able to create with Werewolf. Um, uh, as of the latest version, it leverages the container ecosystem such that you can basically take a container, you can build a container however you normally build your containers, and then you can import that container into Werewolf and then basically say, I want to boot a whole bunch of nodes with this container, and it will actually put that container on the physical bare metal um, that you, know, you want to provision out to. Uh, and so it makes it very easy to maintain. It makes it very easy to, to provision large clusters and also to kind of provision different roles and purposes of your clusters via different container images. Uh, so at a high level, that's kind of what Werewolf is. Excellent. So thank you for that overview. I think it's really appropriate that we have Michael here now because the next question I have is, what makes Werewolf simple to deploy and use and administer? And since you're new to it, or you were new to it, you're not now, what made that simple? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I think uh, what made it simple was that, um, you know, just being able to install an RPM. And then um, I actually went through the Getting Started Guide on the Werewolf's website. And um, it was, from a system administrator viewpoint, pretty quick to grasp. Um, all the different services that it's setting up for you. So I didn't have to go configure DHCP. I didn't have to uh, set up TFTP. I didn't have to set up all those services um, separately. Werewolf actually did it for me. So it was just a simple config file, set my IP address and my control node, I mean my head node, and set that up, run a quick WWCTL configure all, and boom, <laughs> you know, Werewolf was up and running. Uh, then it was just learning how to configure um, to set up my nodes so that I could get my nodes to configure. And again, it's just 
simple it's command line arguments that you're just passing into werewolf and it's doing a lot in the background just to make it easy so that you can then um, have your cluster ready and through ipixie it just boots right up as soon as you know your your node can um, can get its configuration and get provisioned your node is running stateless so um, that made it fairly simple very nice hey, greg i know that that was kind of the intent was to make it so that it was simple to deploy and use it administers i mean having someone new come in like michael and go through that process and now pretty much being an expert it, it's impressive for a piece of software that does something as complicated as what it's doing so I, I always like to ask do you have anything to add to what michael said i mean i know there was intent there when you went down that path of making it simple so I, let you fill in that blank so you you can't take what michael says at face value um because he's he's a brilliant engineer <laughs> so him sure. coming into something and being able to pick it up very easily um is it's because he's awesome now with that being said we were making this we were trying to make this as simple as possible um but uh yeah yeah michael's just awesome so uh, i'm glad to have him on the team <laughs> absolutely and i i'm having decades of experience and this has been around for how long now over 20 like 2001 yeah. um i founded it uh and, and there's some funny stories about the foundation of it as well and and how much i completely blundered the first the first kind of implementation of it um but yeah it stabilized pretty quickly and then once i once i kind of fixed the major i the major thing that was blundered and just so just so everybody's probably curious now that I've said that, um, uh, this was before, so 2001 was before Pixie was mm -hmm. standard on, on network interface cards. So we actually started off, um, not on Pixie, uh, as a matter of fact, we started off on bootable ISO images. So you'd actually use your werewolf control server to, to basically, uh, create ISO images for each one of your nodes and you boot, a, you burn a little CD ROM, CDR and you put that into your node cd-rom and you it, and it knows how to boot from there uh that was the very first version of werewolf uh i i went and presented it at linux world um and uh, everybody the feedback that i got was uh, everybody liked the administration model they liked how it operated they liked the tools but what the heck am i thinking regarding these cd-roms and isn't there a better way of doing that uh and the one person raised that raised their hands and said, you know, there's a booth in the back over in the expo hall for Etherboot. Uh, go talk to them. And I said, oh, great feedback. Awesome. Right after the talk, answered a few questions, went over to the back of the expo hall and uh, met with the Etherboot um, uh, team. And Etherboot, if you're not familiar, was the predecessor, at least in the open source world, to Pixie. And they created uh, images uh, that you can flash on the ROMs of your NICs or boot like on a floppy drive, because again, this is 2001, um, on a floppy drive or CD if you want, but a tiny little image that basically loads what's called an option ROM into the BIOS, which tells the BIOS that this device is actually bootable. And it will now show up in your BIOS configuration. You can select your network card as a bootable device, like a, like a SCSI card. Select that as a bootable device, and that option ROM will then um, give the necessary capability to that net network card to basically do a boot. And it worked very similar to how Pixie ended up kind of taking off uh, and, and, and growing from there. But that was the predecessor predecessor to, to Pixie. And uh, so we then moved to Etherboot, and for a while, um, we always had, you know, people had to flash their ROMs in their NICs or get NICs that had special ROMs on them for Etherboot, um, or just use a floppy drive for, so for a while, actually, even an early werewolf, uh, you almost always had a little floppy disk that you put in that matched your NIC, put the floppy disk in and you actually, that, that was how you booted before Pixie. And then as soon as Pixie started taking off, that was a very easy transition, uh, and, and motivation. So we just basically moved everything now from Etherboot over to Pixie and it's been Pixie ever since, um, well, kind of now, now it's iPixie, but it's still Pixie. Nice. Thank you for that. So I think one of the other things I want to make sure that we talk about is we have support for x86 and arm, right? It's not just an x86 platform that supports arm as well. Fantastic. Yep. 
And then let's talk about use cases. So what are some of the use cases for doing a werewolf install? I mean, what, what different types? So werewolf is originally designed for um, high performance computing clusters. And the, the predominant reason for that is in an HPC cluster, you can have tens, hundreds, or even thousands of compute nodes that are all virtually identical. Every one of them is running the same OS, same versions, or you hope you want them to be. Otherwise, you get version creep and you run into other problems. So you want everything happens. to be running. Never, never happens. Not with Werewolf, actually. <laughs> it never happens. <laughs> but you, you want everything to be uh, um, as, as similar and homogenous as absolutely possible. Uh, now, you could have groups of nodes that are different. So you could have 100, node over, 100 nodes over here that's running one version of the OS, 100 nodes over here that's running a different version of the OS, 100 nodes over there that maybe has different configurations or different permissions on certain things, uh, on access controls and whatnot. Uh, Werewolf was designed for that. Werewolf is designed to be able to bring um, large amounts of resources kind of together. Now, in terms of use cases, HPC was the obvious one. It was, it was very easy. It was what it was initially developed for. Uh, but one of the interesting things that happened, um, I think it was about 2000, before 2010 or maybe around 2010, is I started to hear of people using werewolf clusters for different purposes. Uh, the first one that I heard was uh, the Guitar Center and Musician's Friend was using it to power their entire web infrastructure. Uh, any musicians out there um yeah for a while I, I doubt they're still using it but this was a while ago um i think it was musicians friend and guitar center um that reached out to me uh and i said well if you ever need any help i could use a les paul um <laughs> and uh didn't happen but uh but yeah so there were people using werewolf just as an example for for different kinds of use cases and uh, but but the majority of it is is high performance computing. Uh, we have actually and, and Michael, you may be able to talk a little bit more definitively on this. Uh, we now have actually even considered, and I think we've even now uh, proof of concept, the notion of being able to spin up Kubernetes clusters and other types of clusters using Werewolf. So it's it's you know the fact that we're based on a container image means anything you can put into a container that you want to run on bare metal, you can pretty much do. Excellent. Yeah, Michael, I, I toss it over to you now. Have you been seeing that as a use case that, that you're running into? Yeah, I mean, one of our customers, we used Werewolf to provision control plane nodes. Um, and we're deploying Kubernetes on those uh, control plane nodes and then bringing up our compute nodes um, the part of that has to do with um, another product that we have here at CIQ, uh, Fuzzball Substrate. So that's what, where we've been using that. So we have a, a nice tool called IQ, which allows us to deploy from the Werewolf uh, control node to our three control play nodes and then bring up our compute nodes. And they're all running Fuzzball Substrate, immediately start talking to our cluster. And, uh, you know, within, I'm going to say, depending on how fast your machine is, I'm going to say anything from 15 minutes to maybe half an hour, you have a fully functional um, cluster ready to go and run some workflows. So that's one of the, the use cases that we've been using. I've been using it a lot uh, as well for testing. So testing our products, and it makes it easy, cause, especially because it's um, stateless. Uh, one nice thing is I'm able to bring something up, if it doesn't work, I just reboot the machine, and try it again. Um, so, you know, and then with a little bit of scripts that you have to, you know, uh, clean things up, but it just, it's made it much easier for um, testing and development purposes. So Michael, sorry, Zay, I'm jumping in. Uh, yeah. uh, Michael brings up a really good point and it's something, you know, we didn't really talk about is the concept of stateless. Um, when we provision nodes in a stateless way, um, we're basically provisioning them so uh, when you turn off the computer, the whole concept of what was installed, the operating system, everything kind of goes away. It's like it was never installed. Uh, and there's several different ways that you can achieve uh, a stateless compute um, uh, you know, fabric. 
And, and the way that Werewolf does by default is to actually run it out of system memory. Uh, so if you have, let's say, for example, um, uh, a, a container image, and you want this container image to run on these 100 compute nodes, it makes it very easy to manage if you just turn on those compute nodes and they all get that exact same container image. And if you have one node that's doing something a little bonkers, a little weird, it's very easy to basically say, well, it's not software because the nodes above and below are are running just fine. So you got some sort of weird hardware issue going on and you know you can start looking at the hardware to see what's going on there. Um, I can tell you from uh, some of the initial goals of, of why we created Werewolf and, and what we were trying to do with it is really to simplify the management of these sorts of systems. And that helps a lot. If in your cluster you are managing a, a large number of servers or workstations, um, it kind of equivalent, right? Put air quotes around it again. If that's what your kind of th th that's what your your administration model is, then if you have a thousand nodes in your clusters and each one of them is is installed directly, um, you have to manage each one directly. There are tools to facilitate the management, uh, configuration management tools and whatnot, provisioning tools, kickstart things like that. But if each one is physically installed. Um, you can start over time, you can end up with what we kind of alluded to before, which is version drift, where you can have slightly different versions of different aspects of your cluster. And sometimes that's very difficult to find if you have a very big cluster, um, it, you know, any sort of differences and whatnot. What Werewolf does again, because every time you reboot that computer, you can guarantee the image and integrity of that image uh, as it's being provisioned. Uh, it makes it again very easy to install. So whether you're doing something like a traditional HPC stack, um, let's say you have you know InfiniBand drivers, GPU drivers, you have maybe Luster file system drivers in there, uh, you can distribute all of that into one container. When you provision that container out, it's going to boot that whole stack. If you provision it out to another cluster, it'll boot that cluster with that exact same stack. If you put that up in the Docker Hub or or any of the public registries, you can actually share that with other people, which means for things like, again, a traditional HPC stack, an open HPC stack, it makes it real easy now to distribute kind of that, that system profile to any clusters out there. And then Werewolf will handle the configuration management uh, that you need to to be running in order to manage differences between nodes, IP addressing, uh, host names, service configurations. Werewolf comes with a very small, um, simple configuration management system, uh, which is all templatized. So you can have one file for all nodes that boot, and when it boots, it will get the template that you've configured for that node. That could be things like IP addressing. Um, you know, if you have InfiniBand on some nodes, you can, can define that as well. So there's a lot you can do uh, with, with Werewolf in this regard. Um, and, and again, kind of, you know, going back to the original question um, re regarding, um, you know, use cases and, and whatnot, you can do things like, again, traditional HPC, you can do an open HPC stack very easily. And what Michael kind of brought up, which is Fuzzball, which is our HPC 2.0 stack. And you can use Werewolf to provision out that entire stack, both the compute resource as well as the management resource and the control plane for that entire cluster. So a lot you can do with it. Oh, and it's also, I should mention, it's also operating system neutral, right? So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're very closely associated with, with Rocky Linux, but you don't have to run Rocky Linux with it. You can run any of the enterprise Linux derivatives, but you can also run any of the Debian derivatives. You can run SUSE on it. Um, and through it, as a matter of fact, SUSE has been an amazing partner um, with, with Werewolf. And they're actually contributing and helping us with the development of Werewolf. And SUSE runs fantastic with Werewolf. So uh, another aspect to consider is just how portable, simple, lightweight it is. Um, and it's just, yeah, very easy to deal with solution. Yeah, the partnership part of that to me is exciting. Uh, you did talk about a when you have multiple clusters or you have several different clusters, can you control all of that from one werewolf controller or do I need a separate werewolf controller for each type of cluster that I'm going to run? You can control it from all of one werewolf control surface as long as you're managing your broadcast mm -hmm. domain. So Michael mentioned that 
you know, TFTP, DHCP, or kind of, you know, they're, they're required services whenever we're talking about Pixie. Werewolf will configure that for you. But at some point, you're scaling up your cluster so big that you actually have to start managing your broadcast domain. Because uh, the last thing you want is storms or loops or something to um, all of a sudden take out, take out your network. Uh, when you're dealing with large clusters, and the, and the traditional Beowulf model is very flat. Right? So a lot of people say, well, we're just going to put that on just one gigantic network segment uh, and, and not manage the broadcast domain. You can do that for 1,000 nodes, for 2,000 nodes. You can even go 2,500 nodes-ish. At some point, you really want to start dealing with your broadcast domains. Now, there's a multiple ways of dealing with your broadcast domains. One is you just create relays between your routed networks. Uh, and then route between them and then do DHCP uh, relaying. But the other way is you basically have multiple werewolf control surfaces. Um, so maybe one on this, this logical network and one on this you know, logical subnet, and you now have two werewolf servers. Now, this also kind of mitigates some of the scalability factors. Um, werewolf will scale many thousands of nodes uh, with one werewolf server. Uh, but at some point, just for resiliency, you probably don't want to put many thousands of nodes on just one werewolf server. So you may want to spread that spread that load out a little bit. Now, this is a very long way and a roundabout way of answering your question regarding um, can it do multiple clusters? With however you're managing your broadcast domains, however you're managing your werewolf infrastructure, werewolf is designed to be able to have um, multiple node groups via profiles and different node configurations. So you can absolutely, you can separate this into, into network segments or subnetting um, and managing your broadcast domain between systems and have you know werewolf clusters kind of running all of that. But another way of doing this is to basically just have one big cluster that has different groups of nodes for different purposes or different um, research initiatives or different um, uh, projects or PIs um, w within your organization. And you can then kind of break apart your nodes into different groups. Again, based on these other factors, you can break them apart could also be in terms of vintage of hardware. Many organizations building HPC clusters, they, they go into it and say, okay, well, this year we've got $3 million we're going to spend for capital equipment purchases. We're going to buy, um, our, our base cluster, but you know, now next year they, they have another million bucks. And now they're going to add to it. But the node profiles have now changed a little bit. And you might be able to kind of still bulk them together. But at some point, if you keep doing this every year, at some point, you're going to get older nodes and you're going to get newer nodes. They might still be compatible, but maybe you have to put them on different InfiniBand fabrics because InfiniBand has now changed so, so much. And you have to start managing your, your network fabric and whatnot. And at some point, your end of lifing. And you don't want to have like an, a big parallel MPI job running between the newest nodes and the oldest nodes because then you're going to get mixed performance and you're always going to go as fast, especially on a tightly coupled application, is going as, as fast as your slowest node. So now you've got your newest nodes sitting there that are not completely utilized. And anyway, long story short, too late. Um, you could basically, <laughs> you could basically um, uh, create pseudo partitions within Werewolf based on configuration, node groups, and profiles. Um, different kernel images, different OS images, different roles. You could have file system, IO based nodes. You could have your luster storage uh, compute, uh, excuse me, your luster storage nodes, and then your compute nodes over here, right? So there's a lot of ways you can kind of mix and dice. How are you setting up your, your, your cluster infrastructure? And Werewolf is completely um, flexible to all of that. Outstanding. One question I do have is whenever you, whenever you start working with a tool like Werewolf, one of the first things that people are going to want to know, or that I would want to know is what kind of pre-configured cluster images are there? I mean, am I going to have to go build this thing from scratch or is there something that I can just install it and start using out of the box? Uh, there are some pre-configured images out there. Uh, we post some, we have got some up in Docker hub. Uh, for node images, you can get there in Docker Hub. It's just under the, uh, the the organization name Werewolf, and you'll find Rocky images there, CentOS images there, OpenHPC images there. Uh, but for the most part, you can use almost any image that's up in Docker Hub, which is actually kind of kind of crazy to think about. 
Now, there's one kind of gotcha. There's actually maybe two gotchas. The first gotcha is when people create the default container images that they put up into Docker Hub, they are technically, they don't have a full boot capability associated with them. System D has masked out a bunch of services. They have core utils that are designed just for single user mode um, and not multi-user mode. So you have to make a few changes to them. But once you've made those changes, and those changes, by the way, are, are, are public in Werewolf, so you can see how to, how to change those. Once you've made those changes, you can pretty much boot almost any image that's in Docker Hub today and actually provision that out to bare metal hardware and then run that in a stateless way. Uh, so uh, in terms of turnkey solutions, again, uh, we provide a few. So if they're, you know, not to make this a, a, a sales pitch, but um, if you are interested in turnkey solutions uh, around Werewolf, we can help um, help you. We've got ones that we've already made, but we can also help tune and help create those uh, for customers. Um, Open HPC, as I mentioned before, and uh, HPC 2.0, uh, our, our cloud native, cloud hybrid federated meta orchestration platform for, for performance critical workloads and data. Ha, ah, we have that too. You need an acronym for that. Just one long drawn out acronym. <laughs> it's kind of fun to say once you get once you get going on it. Nice. So one of the other things that, that I find interesting is integration with other tools. And when you look at configuration management, I know we talk about where we'll be able to do configuration management of its own, but I know it will also integrate with other configuration management tools, correct? I'll take this one and then I'm going to be quiet for a little while. Um, <laughs> I feel like, I feel like I'm taking, stealing, uh, uh, Michael's, um, <laughs> mic time. Uh, sorry about that. Um, the uh, the configuration management system that's in, inside of Werewolf is really designed around um, how do you provision configuration changes to a system before SBIN init is called. And SBIN init, um, in case you're not familiar, uh, is the parent of all processes. You do a PS on your system, it is PID1, which means how do you make changes? How do you get uh, configurations onto a node before SBIN init is called as PID1. And that's what Werewolf does. Werewolf will make changes. So if you have system configuration changes, network configuration, um, you know, uh, IP addressing, all of that sort of stuff, it has to be there before system D starts. And Werewolf will be in charge of that. You can use it for other things in dynamic files like um, your, your credentialed files, your, your Etsy password, Etsy, um, you know, groups, files and whatnot. You can use it for that. Uh, so you can ensure that you users have accounts on the system and whatnot. And Werewolf is good at that. But if you need anything that's really more complicated than, than that base level of, of configuration management, you really should be looking at just layering Ansible or Puppet or or CF Engine or or Chef or whatever you're you you are comfortable and whatever you prefer using, just put that into the node image and configure it in the node image. Then when all the nodes boot, they'll not only boot with the Werewolf configuration that you've set through Werewolf to ensure that everything's there when the system you know when system D is is running and is called, but then you can actually then do further configuration management using whatever tools that you prefer. So um, yes to both. Excellent. And I see that we've got a question from Jonathan that popped in. Uh, he's asking about Werewolf 4. So what's the status of open HPC support, packaging, documentation, tutorials for Werewolf 4? Jonathan, I was going to be quiet here, um, but uh, I'll answer this question. <laughs> and then I'm going to try to be quiet again. Uh, emphasis on the try. Uh, I don't know, Yoda quotes are going through my head now. <laughs> um, okay, so... Uh, Open HPC support uh, supports currently Werewolf version three. A uh, really good call on that. Uh, Werewolf three uh, is a little bit long in the tooth in terms of um, age and and whatnot, and it has not had a huge amount of active development in, in quite some time. Uh, everything has been now moved over to Werewolf four. But to your point, Open HPC has not adopted Werewolf four yet. Uh, we are currently working with the Open HPC team. Uh, the OpenHPC team is actually even contributing fixes, um, patches, and whatnot into Werewolf 4 as it is being prepared to be brought into OpenHPC. So it shouldn't be much longer. 
Um, but uh, it is in progress, but it's not quite there yet. I would anticipate that it should get there in the next major release of OpenHPC, and I'm sorry I don't recall what release that's going to be, but um, I have I have strong confidence that it is going to be in OpenHPC in the nearest future. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Jonathan. Michael, I want to give you some time. I know that you had prepared something to show us, something we can look at. So I will turn it over to you for that. All right. I'm going to give this a shot. You know, live demos are always fun. So um, can you make your screen a little bit bigger if you don't yep. mind. Sure. The font. The font. Yeah. yeah. Right there is good. One more. One more. One more. Perfect. Okay. Right. So um, I just wanted to show briefly how to um, initially configure um, a profile, set up some nodes. And I am actually using three nodes up on a VPS provider. So, and these are not bare metal machines. They actually, this provider um, supports iPixie, so booting. So um, if I remove this screen, you actually see I have my three nodes here and they're trying to communicate, but I don't have uh, these nodes set up yet. So I, it's actually just set up, it's, it's retrying every minute. What we're gonna do, hopefully, if my demo works, um, we're gonna watch these three nodes get their configuration as soon as it's configured in Werewolf and boot right up. Um, so getting back to here, um, the first thing I want to do is I want to set some uh, kind of like defaults in the profile. So now with profiles, you can have multiple profiles. I believe uh, Greg mentioned that already. Um, so this, I'm just going to use the default profile uh, to set some, um, some things. For instance, um, I know that on my nodes, um, my uh, three nodes that I showed you, um, I actually have two interfaces on them. One of the interfaces I have set up to be on a private network. And that's where I'm going to manage over that private network uh, from Werewolf, uh, these three nodes. So one of the first things I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm copy and pasting this to speed up the time. Um, I'm going to uh, set my ETH1 device network uh, interface because that is on the private network. Um, and I'm going to set a default net mask. Now, the reason why I want to do this, so if I list this, the reason why I want to do this is that this is going to be applied to all my nodes. Um, I can add a new node. That will be there. I do not have to set that now for that node. It's automatically going to be applied to all nodes that I add. Um, so that's one of the benefits of having profiles. You can set a profile um, based uh, that can be applied to multiple nodes at once without having to sit there and, and do that for every single node that I'm bringing up. Um, the other thing that I'm going to do is, uh, I probably should have done this first, is um, I'm going to import a container, okay? Because I'm also going to set, if we notice, um, over here, I have the ability to set a default container. So this again, uh, helps simplify my need to every time I add a node, having to set a container per node. Um, so there's gonna be some use cases where you're going to wanna override that and you can do that. You can override these settings per node. But if you know that the majority of the nodes are gonna have the same container, you can just set that up here. So um, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna import the, this image is uh, what um, Greg mentioned earlier, that we have some uh, images ready to go on Docker Hub under uh, Werewolf namespace. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to bring in the Rocky image. Now, I had already done this before, so you notice it went pretty quick. Um, it was cached. But right now, I'm bringing in that Rocky container, Rocky Linux. OK, and now it's building my container. And then uh, the next thing I want to do is, as soon as it's done building, is I'm going to set this uh, as my default container. And I believe I probably could have done that in one command line. Um, I probably should have 
done that to show you, but I believe there's a flag that you can add to make that your default. So instead of having two separate steps. Greg is um, nodding, yes, so there yeah. it must be. I saw that I was getting the confirmation there. So I'm gonna go ahead and set this container as my default container on my profile. So now if I list the values I've just set, I now have my default container. I have my default net mask for, uh, for that interface. Um, the other thing I'm gonna do um, is, um, I've already done this. Uh, I'm just checking here. Um, the next thing I'm gonna do now, this is something that I know I need to do uh, current with the current uh, Rocky image that was brought in. Um, I'm going to enable um, the network so that when I boot up my nodes, um, it will automatically uh, bring up the network interfaces. Um, this is something actually I think is being worked on to, so we don't have to do this step. But in my testing for this demo, I saw that I needed to do this. So I can actually, now that I have the container set up and built uh, here in Werewolf, I can actually go inside that container. So it's just as simple as doing a w, WCTL container exec, um, specify my container name, and then I'm just gonna do bin bash. And now I'm inside my, my container here. Um, and from within here, I can just do a simple system CTL enable network. It's gonna create the symlink necessary, and I'm going to exit. Um, and it's gonna rebuild my container. Now, the other thing, I don't think I have time to show that today, but the other thing that we do is you can go into your container, you can bind in a directory, and you can install uh, packages. So if you wanted to make sure, uh, for instance, in this case, Rocky Linux was up to date, you can update the container by just executing into it and running a simple yum or DNF uh, update. Um, or you can install packages like I use it for installing our fuzzball substrate packages into containers. Um, and then once the containers um, uh, been rebuilt, um, all you have to do is reboot your node and it'll pick up the latest container. Um, so I have that network set. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to also set our container, our kernel um, as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to import, if I show you right now, let me clear my screen, see if this makes it a little easier. Um, we do a kernel list. Okay, we don't have any kernels um, set up. So I'm going to just go ahead and do a kernel import. Now this is going to import, this command that I'm running now is going to actually um, import uh, the kernel that's been installed on the Werewolf node. So that's why, so I'm going to just run this and it's going to bring in that kernel. You can specify other kernels, um, but I'm just going to go with the one that's currently running uh, here on my Werewolf um, node. And you noticed, I was able to set that as my default. So now when I look at my, my profile, I now have not only my container, but I now have the kernel that's gonna boot up on those nodes. So that should be it as far as uh, this setup is concerned. Now we wanna set up our nodes. We wanna see some nodes boot. Um, so to speed things up, I'm going to just, uh, Right here, I have one of my nodes. Um, let me do the, the first node. Okay, so this would be the command that we want to run. I already know that my network card, that it, that's its MAC address there, its hardware address. So with this command, wwctl node add, again, I need to refer to which node uh, net device, network device we're going to use. I can set its hardware address. I can set its IP address and I'm going to name, I can name my control, however, um, my node, however I want to do it. So in this case, I named it control one. Now, um, what's going to happen possibly is I'm going to go ahead and add that node. And I didn't want to miss us seeing it actually um, pick up 
that node. So I'm going to start um, adding my other nodes here. Uh, right here. So this is my second control node. And then I'm going to do uh, my other one here. So I've added my three nodes. One thing after you, um, let me just, I can check. Um, you can take a look here. And here you can see uh, all three nodes that I just added. And you can also see what is being set for them. For instance, you notice they're going to pick up Rocky 8 because I set that in my profile, my default profile. Um, they're also going to boot up this kernel. Uh, here is my hardware address. Here is the IP address. And here is um, the net mask that came from that default profile. And see let's something happening. see if anything happens. Greg may have noticed. I see if I missed anything. Um, it didn't pick it up. Let me try a CTL overlay um, build. We didn't get into um, overlays or, or anything here. And if that doesn't do it, I will try to re restart. Um, you know, of course, when you're live, right? Of course. Absolutely. Yeah. Doesn't matter how many times you tested it before, it's just going to fail. Yep. Not fail, hiccup. Funny thing was, uh, I had him sitting here booting and I did it and immediately I saw it. I said, oh, this is going to be awesome to show, show everyone. Let me go ahead. I'm going to try. Uh, um, to reload uh, werewolf just to make sure. While Michael's doing this, guys, if you guys have questions, go ahead and start dropping them in chat. We'd love to hear from you. Also, tell the log. Um, yep. Yeah, restarting the service. Um, this was fixed in a later version to where you didn't have to reset, the, restart the, um, the werewolf service or reload the werewolf service. So hopefully that will do it. See how it says it's an unknown, unconfigured uh, node. Right. I'm just going to speed this up instead of waiting the full minute. There we go. Now I can see it's grabbing its image. So that must be what it is. I'm, I'm using Werewolf 4.2 uh, for the demo right now. Uh, it's been a while since I've actually played with a production release. <laughs> I'm always playing with like the development <laughs> um, versions. Yeah, yeah, so that that's actually been optimized. So it automatically will reload um, the configurations. Right. Yeah, I, I kind of recall seeing that get fixed. And uh, I was going to try to be have a dangerous demo here and run the latest development branch. And then I said, uh, maybe not. <laughs> There's a couple subtle differences in the new version. Obviously, this is being one of them. Um, but another version, uh, another difference is um, the kernel is no longer a required attribute. Uh, the kernel is going to be taken from the container itself. So the container that you imported actually has the kernel within it. And this makes it super nice for us to be able to say, well, we're going to include in this container all of the InfiniBand or GPU support um, or anything else that you need inside of that entire container. So it gives us the ability to package up into an OCI um, container the entire um, stack. So um, that was pretty much uh, the extent I want to show. There's a lot more, obviously, you can do here. Um, but I just wanted to demo the, how easily 
once everything's configured and you saw it didn't take too long to configure the profile, configure the nodes. Once you have that defined, it's even faster. You just bring up nodes and you're just adding their hardware address in a sense, or you know that way you can uh, provision it. And, and then you're in. Uh, I can, you can actually see that the network is up and running here. Um, so uh, that is it. I mean, there's more to this, but obviously we're, we're short on time. So um, I don't know if there's any other question, anything else you want me to show, uh, Greg, while we're here? If not, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was an awesome Thank demo. Um, one other facet as well is uh, Werewolf will actually auto discover nodes as well. So if you, in, you set up a node configuration and it does not have a MAC address configured, and you set the discoverable flag in the node config, uh, Werewolf will automatically, as an, as an unknown node will join, will, will, will check in, it'll automatically just put that in the first available available node slot that is, that is there, and it will inject the, the, the MAC address into that node. Uh, Werewolf will also do IPMI. Uh, so there's a whole group of power status commands, power cycle, power, you know, everything, even um, uh, serial over LAN, SOL, uh, support inside of Werewolf, so you can integrate directly into IPMI um, too. And Werewolf can even configure your IPMI, or actually, actually I should say, try to configure your IPMI. Uh, due to many vendors having slightly different versions of IPMI and how IPMI has, is supposed to be a standard, but everybody's adding different kind of capabilities and, and things, and it's not an extraordinar extraordinarily stable standard. It does the best it can to configure IPMI for you. and most systems, it just works out of the box, but um, uh, it, will, it will do the best it can. <laughs> and IPMI works pretty good. Uh, one of our customers, they're using it quite a bit. Um, and I was even able to set up a virtual IPMI on a KVM machine uh, and do some testing that way, uh, bringing up and bringing down KVM machines or get, you know, guess. Very cool. So real quick, Greg, I, I think we talked about this last time. I just wanna make sure we talk about it again. I think as a part of version four of Werewolf, there's, there's things that are happening or things that you're working on or the community's working on around moving things to APIs. Would you like to brief yeah. us on that real quick? Yeah. So um, right now, Werewolf uh, is a non-client server architecture with regards to the configuration and management of it. Um, we are changing that. So the Werewolf server is going to end up being kind of the uh, the entire control plane for the for the system. The CLI then is going to interact with that Werewolf control server over an API. This gives us the ability to add additional features around that. So for example, we talked a little bit about the HPC 2.0 stack. Uh, Fuzzball is actually going to be able to um, send provisioning commands directly to Werewolf without having to shell out. Everything will go over APIs. Gives us the ability to also create nice graphical interfaces around uh, Werewolf and those capabilities. Um, that process and that work is already underway. So we are expect to see that um, uh, probably next-ish quarter, uh, Q3. Um, and we should be uh, bringing that out at least for early early beta um, by about then and probably stable release, probably end-ish of Q3. Excellent. And I think we, we had, had a question. Yeah, there was a question, a question up. From the Nick. Question just went away. I think, Michael, is. you said you had a good answer to this one. Uh, can you remove <laughs> the kernel parameter from all profiles? Uh, the uh, I think the question is in regards to they probably saw when I did a, a node list, there was some default kernel arguments there. Um, yes, you can actually override that. You can set your kernel arguments um, that you want for that, um, for that node. In fact, we have been using the kernel arguments there for um, like deploying Kubernetes to UC groups uh, version two. So on Rocky or, or uh, on Rocky, we wanna set that so that it enables C groups uh, V2. And so we just, we can override the kernel arguments. Um, so yes, that's definitely configurable there. I'd actually also answer this in a different way as well. Um, I don't know if, if Nick was referring to the comment that I made regarding the kernel being inside of the container 
Um, once you move to 4.3, and if you're using a kernel inside of the container, you would be able to remove the kernel parameter. Um, and I believe how it's currently stated, it will override the kernel that's in the container if you don't remove it. So the kernel argument is actually mm -hmm. becoming a kernel override argument. So if you specify your kernel or kernel override parameter, it will override what is inside of the container. And um, uh, But if you remove it, and if there's a, a kernel inside of your container, uh, you can then remove it safely, and Werewolf will boot the kernel that exists inside of that container. I think that answered Nick's question. Yeah, he was talking about kernel, not kernel arcs. Cool. Thanks for the question, Nick. So last thing, real quick, guys, before we have to drop off, uh, CIQ value adds. So what are we doing to help with Werewolf, or what are we providing on top of Werewolf to make it better? I'll jump in here, and then, Michael, if I miss anything that you think of, uh, please uh, fix or, or correct or add <laughs> to what I say. Um, uh, one of the things that we're working on um, is FIPS compliance. So you're going to see a FIPS compliant version of Werewolf coming out um, probably Q3-ish, uh, which is kind of a cool feature set of features to have, especially as we're moving towards an API base. Um, and we can then put GUIs and other sorts of interfaces on top of that. Uh, that compliance is going to be able to guarantee and, and, and validate the crypto uh, that we're leveraging so you know you have a nice secure system. Um, we're also going to be creating uh, pre-configured, and we kind of already talked about this a little bit, but pre-configured node uh, containers, profiles, um, turnkey solutions around Werewolf, again, traditional HPC as well as HPC 2.0 and Fuzzball. Uh, so we're definitely going to be bringing those, uh, making those available and then support, uh, and then services around that. So that could be anything from, you know, helping with, uh, solutions architecture, helping with integration or just, just support. Just if you have any sort of issues, you can give us a call. Um, one of the things that we're doing, and I know support is, is totally not a cool subject to talk about because it's been done for the last, I don't even know how many decades, uh, but um, one of the cool things that we're doing about with, with support is actually focusing on the people, focusing on supporting people, not supporting cores, sockets, nodes, or entitlements. And that support model is actually really cool because, again, we become uh, the escalation point for people and teams within organizations. And we don't care how many nodes or how many systems or cloud instances or containers or VMs that somebody has to maintain. Mm -hmm. That's their job. That's their responsibility. Our responsibility is to make sure that they are successful and they have the means to get questions answered when and ever they need those questions answered. So that's our support model um, that is offered for not only uh, Werewolf, but also Singularity, Aptainer, uh, and Rocky Linux. Um, and if so if you have any questions, if this is something you're interested in, please do reach out to us and, um, and contact us. Uh, Michael, anything I left out that you wanted to add? No, I mean, we're pretty much uh, active on, you know, it's open source. Um, so we're involved in that community. So a lot of times there's a Slack channel. So a lot of times um, he, uh, us, you know, we're here at CIQ. We are keeping an eye and we help answer questions that way as well. So uh, or if anybody has an issue, sometimes we're, we're immediately looking into it ourselves um, and trying to add, um, you know, value in that way that um, we, you know, uh, are helping to uh, helping everyone to be able to do what they need to get done. Excellent. Thank you. And I see Nick had one last question. So he's asking about are the APIs going to be version so it doesn't break everything as we come out. So, the APIs are built by um, uh, good engineers, not me. So yes, it will definitely be versioned. Excellent. Thank you for the question. Guys, I think we're actually at the end of the time. I want to thank Greg, as always, for being here. Michael, thank you for joining. Thank you for the demo. Glad it actually worked out. It was fantastic. I, I really appreciate the time you put into it. So thank you very much. Thank you for joining, guys. Again, don't forget, like and subscribe, and we will see you again next week. Oh, 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 oh wait, oh, me, oh, me, oh, me in the front. <laughs> quick, quick point. Um, we are hiring. We are scaling the company up. If, if anybody is interested, please do check out our careers page. 
um, and reach out to us. Uh, we'd love to talk with you. There, now I'm done. Excellent. Again, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks again, Michael. Thanks, Zane. Appreciate it. Thanks, Michael. Bye.